Our reading this morning is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 through 4. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. So this summer, I was in Lubbock for a few days, and I can't remember exactly where I was going. But I, I had loaded up my car, and I was getting ready to go, and I sit down in my car, and I, and I look over, and I notice my glove box is open, and stuff is just scattered all over the place. And I make the middle note, I'm like, hey, I got to put that stuff back, start my car, and I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't do that. I take a step back, and somebody had broken into my car the night before. Did not notice it, but when I, the minute I noticed it, there was a sense of, of fear that hit me, this suddenness and this anxiety. And maybe you've had a moment like that where somebody has broken into your house or your car and there is just this fear that is brought upon you. That is what Paul starts chapter 5 with. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It will bring that fear and that suddenness. We've been going through this series through 1 Thessalonians, and we find ourselves in chapter 5 this morning. In this, this, this section of Scripture, Paul is going to talk about something that is so important in this letter. If you remember, he, he sent Timothy to, to these Christians in Thessalonica to get a report. And part of the report that, that, that Timothy brought to him was that these Thessalonians, these Christians, they were confused about the day of the Lord. They were confused about Judgment Day. There were some of them that, that, that thought that they had missed it or that they were going to miss it. And so they lived their lives in this constant state of fear. They were constantly in panic mode. But on the other side of that, you have these other Christians that just kind of waited around for it. They kind of waited for it like they were just waiting for dinner to be brought to them. Sitting there on the couch, couch potatoes I'd call them. Just sitting around waiting for it to happen. And so Paul is going to address this. Our text for this morning is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 through 11. I want us to see the confidence and the assurance that the day of the Lord brings to the believers who are in Christ. And I want us to see that so that we will ha it will impact us to live our lives in inside of his coming. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 2. It says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then suddenness, sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. They will not escape, but you are not in the darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Paul compares the day of the Lord, this final judgment day, to a thief that comes in the night. That thief comes and it brings fear, it brings anxiety, and it brings suddenness, and you can't make preparations for it. But he said, turns to these Christians and he says, but you are not in that darkness. You are not in the night, you are in the day. You are in the light. There is a difference between a thief that comes in the night and a thief that comes in the day. If it comes in the night, you can't make preparations for it. But if it comes in the day and it gives you a warning ahead of time and leaves a note on the door and says, hey, I'm coming to rob you at this time, you can make preparations for that. You can lock your doors. Or if you're a true Texan, you're going to sit on your front porch with your 40-something <laughs> guns and thousands of rounds of ammo. You're, you can make preparations for that. He compares the day of the Lord to darkness. Amos does the same thing in, chapter, in Amos chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Amos says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, 
or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. It is, is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, and gloom with no brightness in it. It is judgment, and it is darkness. But Paul brings these Thessalonians into the light, and in the light is where he is, where Christ is. He reminds these Christians that they're walking in the light, they have the, this confidence and this assurance about them. That day, yes, it's coming, but for them, they're not supposed to be fearful of it. For them, they're supposed to be confident in that day. They're to await that day with, with an eager expectation. Paul spends so much time, we've heard it through these past few weeks, of him commending them for the things that they're doing. He commends these Christians for their faith and their hope and their love. He commends them that they've not only received the truth, but they've lived it out in their lives. And that stuff, that stuff that he has talked about throughout this letter, that gives them confidence in this day. That gives them hope and that gives them assurance. So Paul has addressed those first set of Christians that are fearful for this day. Remember, they... they feel like it's, they've missed it, or they're going to miss it, and they live in that constant state of fear. Paul says that's not the case. Now Paul turns, and he's going to address those couch potatoes, those people that are just sitting around on their rooftops, just waiting, neglecting the responsibilities that they have. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. He says, So then... Those, those, those two words, so then. He's told them the, the confidence that they've had in this. But this confidence is not just to, to have them sit with it and just sit around and wait. This confidence is now going to turn around and impact their behavior. Verse 6, he says, So then let us not... So then let us not... So then let us not sleep. Sorry, I go to sunset. I don't know what that word is. <laughs> it says, So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation." People in the night do things that are done in the night. And people that are in the day do things that are done in the day. Paul says those that are, that are in the night, they sleep all the time. And they, they are, they're drunk. That sleep that he is referring, for, referring to is not death. It is this, this passiveness. This lack of knowledge of the spiritual things going on around them. But he turns to, to these Christians and he says, You're in the day. And you act like people who are in the day. You are awake and you are sober. To be awake means that you are constantly alert of what is going on around you. You have a spiritual mindset of the things going on in your life. You're always assessing what is going on around you with that spiritual mindset. Being awake means that you're in a constant state of readiness. An eager expectation for his return. To be awake means that the person is away, aware of that day that is coming and is living in a sense of readiness for that day. It says, be awake and be sober. To be sober means that you are not under the influence of intoxication. A person who, who is sober exhibits self-control in all that he does. Even when he's driving around Lubbock and the traffic is terrible, there is still self-control. There is a, a sense of seriousness, this balance, this calmness and steadiness in this person's life. The people who are sober, they know what their priorities are in life. They know that, that their life is to glorify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. February 1st, 2009. It was Super Bowl 43, and the two teams were, that were playing in it, well, Let's just say neither of them were the Dallas Cowboys. Let's just get that one, put that one to the side. But the two teams that I were playing in it were the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Arizona Cardinals. This game between them went back and forth. 
and it gets late in the game, and the Steelers are driving down the field. Their quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger, throws this ball in the end zone, and it looks like it's going nowhere. But out of nowhere, this receiver, Santonio Holmes, reaches for that ball and catches it. Now, in the NFL, if you're going to catch a ball, you have to have two feet on the ground. And so if Santonio Holmes were just to jump with all that he had for the ball, he would have caught it, but it wouldn't have counted because he didn't have two feet in the ground. But if he was not aware of his feet and he just got one foot in, it still wouldn't have counted because he had to have the self-control to have two feet in the ground. And so if you look at this picture of this catch that Santonio Holmes has, there's a picture of him reaching with his eyes up towards that ball with all that he has, and his two feet are on the ground. That is the picture that Paul is trying to paint for these Thessalonians. You reach for that day with all that you have. You await that day with an eager expectation. But that eager expectation does not negate the responsibility that you have here on this earth. That eager expectation and assurance that you have does not take away the priorities that you have in this life. So live your life with your eyes up and your two feet on the ground. Paul goes on and he says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. He brings in this armor. And notice that, that, that this armor that Paul talks about, it is not sitting on a, a shelf somewhere collecting the dust. It's not sitting in a closet somewhere. It is on you. And it is as if you were ready to engage in combat. There is a breastplate of faith and love and a helmet, the hope of salvation. The breastplate protects all your organs right here. The helmet is supposed to protect your head. In other words, we need protection in this life. We need to be protected from Satan and his forces. We need to be protected from all that he does to us. Just because you live in the day does not mean that you are free from Satan's attacks. You must be protected. Do you remember what Paul commended them for in chapter 1? When, he, when he's thankful for them, he says, We remember our God and Father, before our God and Father, your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope. Your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. Faith, hope, and love. Those three things Paul then touches here in chapter 5. Those three things are a way of Paul saying, hey, you're, stu you're doing good. You're heading in the right direction. Keep doing what you've been doing. Keep living in the day. But then Paul reminds them in, in verse 9, this, this, these two verses right here. He says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that, we are, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. God has not destined us for wrath. That day is coming. That day when His wrath is poured out is coming. But you must know that God does not desire to pour that wrath out on you. God created you just so that he could pour his wrath out on you. That is not a just God. That is not a good God. He desires for all men to be saved. God created you with the intention of being with him. And that is what he wants for your life, for you to be with him. He desires that so much that he sent his only son to die on that cross for you. And he wants you to experience that day with him, not in his wrath. 1 Timothy 2.4, he desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth of him. But Paul, that, that last phrase in verse 10, he says, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. That is the goal, isn't it? To be with him, to live a life with him. Whether we are awake in this life or we have passed on from this world and are asleep, 
our ultimate priority is to be with him. And then Paul says to encourage one another and build one another up with these words. I don't know about you, but there are times in this life where I need to be encouraged and be mindful of the day that my Lord is coming. To be mindful that he will return. I want to leave you with this question to constantly think about. What in your life would look different if you were living in a constant expectation of our Lord's return? What in your life would look different if you were living in a constant expectation of our Lord's return? I feel like for us, being 2,000 years away from the cross, we can easily forget that He's coming back. Because it happened so long ago, we can easily just go on about our lives, not, not thinking about His return. But for those Christians there in the first century, they just saw him 20, 30, 40 years ago. They believed with all that they had that he was coming back. So every day they woke up and they were looking to the sky, just waiting for that day to come. There are times that I need to be reminded of that. There are times where where we need to be reminded of that where the stress and the anxiety just weigh on us, where we're the times where we're just confronted with sin, and the times that, that the tears and the fears of this life are very real, there will be a day when all of that goes away. I love the song by Jeremy Camp, There Will Be a Day. I just want to, just want to read a couple of those lyrics. He says, There will be a day with no more tears, no more pain and no more fears, There will be a day when the burdens of this place will be no more. We'll see Jesus face to face, but until that day, we'll hold on to him always. And I can't wait until that day where the very one I've lived for always will wipe away the sorrow that I've faced to touch the scars that rescued me from a life of shame and misery. This is why I sing. There will be a day, and how I long for that day to be today. So these these Christians in Thessalonica, they have struggled with this concept of the day of the Lord. Some of them have lived their lives in a constant state of fear, constant panic mode, because they feel like they've missed it. Paul says, no, there is confidence and assurance in this day that you have. And then there's those other Christians that have just sat around on the couch, just waiting for it to be served to them, not living a life that glorifies Him. Paul says, no, that that constant expectation must impact your behavior. You long for that day. You long to be with our Lord. But you also live for Him here in this life. Live a life that glorifies Him. Live your life with your eyes up and your two feet on the ground.